الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله we've completed the ten principles of the path and these are just some completing factors that he's mentioning so he was talking about the various different types of athkar last time we spoke about the uh, dhikr to be done loudly and now he's speaking about more silence so he's saying that muraqiban lillahi fil ahwali litartaqi ma'alim al-kamali muraqiban lillahi fil ahwali ay jami'a ahwalik be conscious of allah muraqib be conscious of allah be focused on allah in all of your states, wherever you are, however you are, whatever you're doing. فَإِنَّكَ بِالْمُرَاقَبَةِ تَرْتَقِي إِلَى الْمُشَاهَدَةِ Because if you're conscious, if you force yourself to be conscious and paying attention that Allah is everywhere, then by this you will elevate yourself, you will climb up and ascend to mushahada, where you'll start witnessing Allah. Initially you have to force yourself to focus that Allah is everywhere, not in terms of place or position but in terms of his actions are everywhere. He is manifest everywhere in terms of what he's doing. Right now we may be seeing human beings around us, books, shelves, carpet, various different things happening. What we need to start seeing is that Allah is behind these things. So that when we see something that's beautiful, we don't necessarily appreciate just its beauty, but we actually appreciate the beauty of Allah who is the maker of it. So that's the idea. It doesn't mean that you actually see Allah physically because that's impossible. That doesn't happen. That's inconceivable. So that's why he's saying that when you start focusing on this and making yourself feel aware of Allah, then you'll actually start observing His signs everywhere. And then he says, وَوِلْ مُشَاهَدَ تَرْتَقِي إِلَى الْمُعَايَنَةِ These are various different stages from, actually, he says, from muraqaba, from the focus, you'll actually get to mushahada, witnessing. And from witnessing, eventually you will ascend to mu'ayana, which means seeing, where you'll actually start seeing Allah signs everywhere. Not just witnessing, I mean, there's a subtle difference between those two. He explains, he says, وَالْمُرَاقَبَ مُلَاحَظَةُ الْحَقِّ تَعَالَى عِنْدَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ So the concept of muraqaba, which could mean, um, we'll just keep it muraqaba for now because he's explaining it anyway. مُلَاحَظَةُ الْحَقِّ It's to be observant and conscious of Allah most high whenever doing anything basically at every juncture in your life <coughs> مثلاً, he gives an example he says إِذَا لَاحَظْتَ حَالَ قَصْدِ النَّفْسِ الْوُقُوعَ فِي الْمَعْصِيَةِ وَجَدْتَهُ تَعَالَى مُطَّلِعًا عَلَيْكِ so he's showing us how to do this in practice he says that for example if you observe yourself, you see yourself during the state of intending to put yourself into a disobedience. If you're about to embark on a disobedience, about to do something wrong, then muraqaba would be that you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching you. So you basically develop this consciousness that Allah is watching me. Now if that happens, that we're about to do a wrong deed and we say, oh no, Allah's watching me, we won't do it because like, oh no, he's watching me, let's not do it right now. You know, that person's watching, no, don't do it right now, let him go away. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's always there, but the point is that we're not always focused on the fact that he's watching. So this is about developing the, this idea, and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara. The idea that whenever I'm doing something, Allah is watching me. فَتَرْجِعُ عَنْهَا حَيَاءً مِّنْهُ So then you would retreat from that disobedience out of embarrassment for Allah. right? Because you'd be embarrassed that Allah is watching you so you won't do it. Now of course that has to be developed. This isn't come, come overnight. That has to be developed. One wants to need to do that. One, wants, one needs reminders that this is what I want. This is the state I want. وَإِذَا لَاحَظْتَهُ حَالَ أَكْلِكْ Now something more mundane. And when you now consider yourself during the time of your eating, وَجَدْتَهُ تَعَالَى So how would you conceive of Allah while you're eating? What's the relevance there? How would you think of Allah when you're eating? 
So wajattahu ta'ala huwa alladhi saqa ilayka dhalika ta'am. It's quite comprehensive. That you will, in this case, you will actually find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brought the food to you. That's how you think about Allah in the time. Okay, this food was provided to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مِنْ غَيْرِ حَوْلٍ مِنْكَ وَلَا قُوَّةٍ لَكَ Without any strength or energy on your part. The way the food was produced and so on from right from the beginning. We're not talking about just how it was cooked. Right? Oh, I cooked it. No. It's about how all the ingredients came together from various different parts of the world. How they were produced. How Allah showered the rains upon them. Allowed them to grow. They were harvested. And so on. Packaged and threshed and packaged and supplied and distributed and eventually acquired. So all of that, that eventually at the beginning of all of that comes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ وَجَدْتَهُ حَرَّكَ يَدَاكَ إِلَىٰ تَنَاوُلِهِ Now it doesn't stop there. Then you will find, you will start focusing and become conscious of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has given you motion in your hands to be able to eat that food. The strength in your hands by which you can take that food and put it, place it in the mouth, that is from Allah. وَجَعَلَ فِيكَ الْقُدْرَةَ عَلَىٰ رَفْعِهِ لِفَمِكَ not just that Allah allowed you to move your hands, but Allah allowed you to raise your hands. See, movement is one thing, and raising adds extra energy, at least from a physic, physics perspective. Allah gave you the ability to raise it to your mouth. Then He allowed your mouth to move. So that you can chew it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also caused now the saliva to flow. So now we've got saliva flowing when you're eating because it needs that for those enzymes to break the food down and help it down. ثُمَّ خَلَقَ فِيكَ قُوَّةَ اللَّذَّةِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make that food just something you shovel in your mouth just for the sake of energy. It's like filling up a car with, with petrol. right? There's no taste for the car in the petrol. It just needs it to go. Likewise, we need actually food to just go, really. But Allah has given us various different taste buds, a very comprehensive palette of taste buds. Right, and along with that, the olfactory senses to be able to feel the presence of the food. So, he has then given you the power of taste, al-mi'da, and thus you take the food down to your stomach. Thumma rattaba ala thalika. So now, once the food goes down into the stomach, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala produces and induces thereafter an energy in your body, warabak, and then nurtures you based on that food. So that food is then used as the fuel. But the difference between us and the car, or between us and the phone that has a battery that just needs fuel, it doesn't taste it, we actually enjoy the food that we generally eat. But then after that, it does the same thing, which is that it gives you strength, and it nourishes you, it makes you grow. فَجَعَلَ مِنْهُ لِلَّحْمِ نَصِيبًا So now with that food that's gone down into the stomach, it sorts it out. It gives a portion for the flesh to grow. وَلِلْعَظْمِ نَصِيبًا and then some part of it is contributing to the bones. nasiban, And then the muscles and so on and so forth. So that allocation is taking place automatically in the stomach because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's design. We take all of this for granted obviously. But this is an exercise. That's why physics, if somebody does it right, it could actually take you to Allah. If somebody does it right. If they don't stop at just the experiment itself, but they start considering how it was all coming together. Now there's obviously a part which there's going to be residue. That part which was a carrier of the food, which is not going to be of any benefit, that has to then be excreted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause you to excrete that. Thus, it, it's not left in your stomach. فَتَعْلَمْ بِذَلِكْ أَنَّهُ لَا فَاعِلَ سِوَاهِ If you focus on it at that level, at that minute level, in that, with that kind of elaboration and sophistication, then you will soon know that there is nobody, there is no agent besides him. There is no doer besides, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who has caused you to do all of this. Now, he's telling us that this has to be developed. So he says, فَإِذَا قَوِيَ هَذَا الْمَعْنَى فِيكَ سُمِّيَ وَحْدَةَ الْأَفْعَالِ He's getting into some terminology here. 
He's saying that when this particular type of focus and meaning becomes strengthened in you, where you can actually start thinking at this level, right? And I think in the beginning you have to push yourself and force yourself, but I think eventually these things will become quite second nature to think at this level. Summiya wahdat al afal. This is called wahdat al afal, which basically means unity in actions. So basically, all actions that you see happening around you, even though there are human beings involved in that or other beings involved in that, it's actually Allah subhanahu wa taala. So your tawheed is of the actions of Allah subhanahu wa taala. You're declaring Allah subhanahu wa taala to be one in terms of all of His actions. You've actually seen that now in action. Wasirta mushahidan lillahi fi kulli shay. Now, you will become a witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything. So even when I'm reading this book, my, the point is that I must be thinking how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this knowledge to come down over the generation after having inspired the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with this knowledge first, him conveying it down, allowing it to come down to us, then to come down to London here for us to study it, for this book to be published, for it to be, have been edited, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given tawfiq to the author and the editor to be able to produce it in this way so that it's easy for us to understand for this all to come together at the end of the day all of this that's happening us sitting here together is not random it's not a coincidence it's planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah for a good cause and we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us for this despite the fact that we haven't done much to be honest but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us so it's just about thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every one of these aspects فَإِذَا Now, he says that now you'll become a witness to Allah in everything. فَإِذَا قَوِيَتْ هَذِي الْمُشَاهَةِ Now when this witnessing now becomes stronger, this مُشَاهَةِ, this witnessing grows stronger. حَتَّى غِبْتَ عَمَّا سِوَ اللَّهِ When you become so immersed in this, you'll see nothing else eventually. You'll see everything else, but you won't believe that they have much action to themselves. Because you'll know that the hand behind all of this is Allah. The power behind all of this is Allah. When you know that, then you... You see, if you've got somebody who has, uh, is producing something, right? And that's the front face of the company. So you, you really respect that individual that, wow, you know, you, because you think that they're the face of the company, they must be producing everything. So you have a lot of respect for them. But as soon as you go deeper and you find out that, no, they're just the spokesperson, the real masterminds behind it are X, Y, and Z people. Then when you see this person, you'll immediately, what, what happens? Do you still hold the same respect for that person as before? No, because your attention has now moved to the people behind that, the real cause behind it. That becomes now insignificant. It's, ne it's needed, right? It's needed because the manufacturers, the real designers or whatever cannot be at the fore because they do what they do best. So they need a spokesperson, right? So there's a need for that. But at the end of the day, the focus of ours, it goes deeper. And that's considered more sophisticated thought, right? Rather than focus on the superficial. <clears throat> so by this, this is how the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for them, the world becomes nothing. Because they're just seeing Allah everywhere. So the world becomes nothing. So he says, when this kind of witnessing becomes stronger, such that you now become absent of everything besides Allah. Though you're sitting among people, you're eating the best of dishes, you're wearing the best of clothes, you may be traveling in the best of vehicles. You know who's behind it all. You just don't know, you're conscious of it. One is I know, any Muslim, a good Muslim who understands this stuff, okay, who's behind it? We say Allah. But the whole point of this is that you're actually aware of it all the time. That's why he's saying, Summiyat Mu'ayyanatan. Now this level is called Mu'ayyana. A seeing. وَوَحْدَةُ ذات. Now you know that there is no real entity that can do anything except Allah. All of the other entities are superficial. They exist. We don't want to deny realities of things. These are not just illusions. Although if you start looking at it from another perspective, everything does become an illusion. At the end of the day, because what you're looking at, what you're seeing, it's just all brainwaves, to be honest, at the end of the day. If you want to really take it down to that level, but let's not do that. Because we want to feel and to see and uh, feel that it's substance. But at the end of the day, since everything, Allah is behind everything, that means 
nothing is a real existence besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why he's saying wahdatu that. Now you have declared the oneness of Allah in his essence. You've truly declared it now. Not just as a belief, but now as a witnessing of that. فَإِذَا زَادَ tamkin. Now all of this is always intensifying and growing. So he says that when this becomes more, when the strength of this increases, when this becomes more firmly established, شَاهَدْتَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ أَنَّهُ خَالِكٌ لِعَبْدِهِ وَمَا عَمِلْ After that, you will become a full witness to the fact that Allah is the only creator of His servants and what they do as well. So you know, initially at least we had some kind of um, idea that we are doing something. So we were at least attributing our own actions to ourselves. But we get to such a level that we start understanding that no, nothing of what people do is actually their action. Yes, it's attributed to them. They feel like they're doing it. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, then it's Allah behind everything. So then why are people punished or rewarded for the actions they do if Allah is behind everything? Because when you look at it on a micro level, then it is people who are doing it. So that's why, and that's how they feel it. That's how they experience it. Every one of us experiences that idea. That's why we will be rewarded or punished for what we do. But when somebody looks at the grand picture, then it's actually Allah behind everything. But we're not judged according to that. The judgment is according to the micro understanding. It's just a way to kind of reconcile between free will and the qadr and, and uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's in brief. وَهَذَا مَعْنَى قَوْلِهِمْ And this is what is meant by their statement that مُشَاهَدَةُ اللَّهِ قَبْلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Whenever you experience something, see something, whatever, you first see Allah. Basically, you will see things but you see Allah first because immediately your mind goes to who made this? Who's behind this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, Allah's... Oh yeah, that one, I know. That, Allah, you know, that's... So for example, you know, somebody who really knows artwork, oh that's a really big, yeah, that, that was done by Van Gogh, you know, that one, yeah, that's his as well, that's his as well. Like you know it so well, that immediately as soon as you see it, your mind goes to who did it. Right, sorry about these examples. But, you know, you look at a phone, it's like, okay, no, that's an iPhone, I mean, everybody knows that. I'm saying something more intricate, right? Yeah, you know, that's, that's that publisher, that's that editor, that's that you know, manufacturer or whatever. Yep, definitely. I know that. You have to become so professional at this that you just know Allah's trademark everywhere. And it's everywhere. There's nothing to, you know, there's nothing you can do. You get in trouble, there's nothing you can do. Somebody's driving, right? And they get a flat tire. So they carry on, they get to their destination. Jumu'ah pray, for example. They've got a bit of petrol left. So they go and they get their tire changed and they've got a bit of petrol so they go on to the next petrol station and they stop there and now their petrol uh, what do you call that uh, the flap of the uh, where you put the petrol in that's not opening trying everything it just doesn't open and they've got about maybe 15 miles left and they've they've got uh, uh, well it says 15 miles on their clock and they've got about 15 miles to travel so they think, well, I can't stand here 15 minutes banging this open, trying to open it, break it or whatever. So now let me try to get home and there somebody may help me. So now they're going on their way and they're looking at the petrol gauge, right? And it's clicking down and they're looking at their, um, their what do you call it, navigation to see how many miles left. Imagine the tension. Now they've just had a flat tire and they've also, now the petrol door doesn't open. What are you going to do about it? Will cursing help? Will complaining help? No. The only thing you can do is Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. And hopefully I'll get home and hopefully this will be sorted. So they get close to home, they go to another petrol station saying, I don't want to take this home because if the petrol stops there, uh, ends there, finishes there, then I'm going to have to get a can and, and all the rest. Let me stop at a petrol station. And there's a mechanic there and he checks it out and he finds out that the the certain engine, what do you call it, the motor of the thing which locks that petrol door, uh, petrol door, whatever it's called, that's faulty. So he pulls it off, and now the thing he can open, and he puts petrol in. Now it's all fine. 
what else were you going to do? So at the end of the day, there's a reason why all of these things happen. So if, I'll, if somebody can think about Allah in that, they get some reward out of that. Right? Maybe that was just one way of Allah telling them to remember Him. Because complaining is not going to help at all. Nobody's going to come to your service just because you complain. Right? فَإِذَا That's why he's saying that uh, وَهَذَا مَعْنَا قَوْلِهِ مُشَاهَدَةُ اللَّهِ قَبْلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That you witness Allah before everything. وَهَذِهِ أُمُورٌ ذَوْقِيَّةٌ مِنْ وَرَاءِ تَوْرِ الْعَقْلِ He said this is a matter of taste and experience beyond being able to rationally explain it. So he's tried to explain it as rationally as possible. I've added some modern um, examples to this. But he says, really, you won't really understand this because this is a matter of experience. And it goes beyond the limits of your rational faculties. لا يعرفها إلا أهل العنايات. And he says that it's only the people of special attention by Allah who will understand these things as well. It's not something that you just get like that. You have to try and you have to ask Allah. And if Allah wants to give it to us, he will then open it up to us. وَالنُّفُوسَ الْقُدْسِيَ And people with pure hearts, who've worked hard to purify their hearts. رضي الله عنهم وعنا بهم May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. And pleased with us because of them. These 13 characteristics are of those people who have reached this level that he just described. People who reach this level will have the following 13 qualities. Shall we do some of them? He says, وَمِنْ آدَابِ هَذِهِ الطَّائِفَةِ الَّتِي يَحْصُلُ بِهَا الْكَمَالِ Some of the etiquette of this particular group of people who, by, by which they've attained this perfection, right? by which they've attained this kind of perfection. Number one, مُلَازَمَةُ الطَّهَارَةِ وَالنَّوْمَ عَلَيْهَا Seems like a mundane act. Constantly on wudu, on purity, and even sleeping upon it. Which means that you make wudu before sleeping. So, as every time you break your wudu, that you have to use the toilet, you, have, you, you break your wudu, you go and make wudu, you refresh your wudu. And, and the thing is that a lot of people may think that's difficult, right? But it's actually not very difficult once you get into the habit. You'll actually start feeling very uncomfortable if you're not on wudu. Once you get into the habit, it becomes second nature. The brain becomes hardwired to think that way and to do that. So what will happen then is that if you're not on wudu, you'll feel really bad. So you're like, you'll feel uncomfortable. I need to make wudu. That means every time you start your prayer, every time you're about to pray, you know you're on wudu. Right? The exception will be when you're not on wudu. You're like, no, I need to do wudu. وَعَدَمُ كَشْفِ الْعَوْرَةِ الْمُغَلَّظَةِ فِي الْخَلَوَاتِ حَيَاءً مِنَ اللَّهِ وَمِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Now this is not necessary, but this is an adab. Because I remember I had just had this discussion with somebody just in the last few days. They will never unclothe their... They will never unclothe their intimate private parts when alone even. It doesn't mean you can't unclothe it, but a person may think nobody's here, why, why does that matter? I remember somebody asked this question. Because some ulama have written that as makru, <coughs> while others said it's fine. But the thing is that there's an adab issue. So he's saying that these are people who are observant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in that, that they won't remain unclothed. Now, some people, you know, there's various ways of thinking, right? For example, once I was at a program and somebody came and asked, uh, somebody sent a question, I don't feel anything in my prayer, so that's why I've given up prayer. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that I don't feel anything in prayer, but I'm going to keep trying. Right. It's a narrative, isn't it? So in here, you've got the same kind of thing where he's saying that even in... Somebody might think that, well, Allah can see me anyway. Even if I've got clothes on, He can see whatever I am. He can see right through me. So what's the point of clothes then? That's another way of looking at it. But the thing is that a good Muslim, a good believer, needs to have their thought of an honorable level. That, that's the difference. Unfortunately, the times that we're living in, 
it teaches us to think of things in the most negative and vulgar of ways. But being a believer, we are supposed to think of things in an honorable way. There's a difference between that. Right? Think of things in the most honorable way possi possible. So these people, they do not, re do not uncover their, private, their, their intimate private parts, even when alone, out of embarrassment in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the angels. And number three, he says, وَمِنْهَا تَوْقِيرُ kabir They respect and revere the older people than them. Their elders, they respect them. وَالشَّفَقَ ala الصَّغِيرِ and they're compassionate on the younger ones, wal aramil wal masakin, and on widows and poor and the needy, bal ala jami il khalk. In fact, on all of creation, because now they've started realizing that this creation is basically this creation is the creation of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. When you love somebody a lot and something associated with them come. I mean, these guys who are fascinated by Apple. Right? They see an Apple case, they see an Apple keyboard, they see an Apple mouse. It's like everything is just exciting. Like why not? It's another Apple product, why not? Right. It's the same kind of thing here. Once you start seeing Allah, then you will actually become better with everybody. Because now you actually see them as Allah's creation as opposed to an individual Ahmed or Yusuf or Muhammad who may have said something bad to you at one time, may have... Uh, offended you sometime? No, he's Allah's creation now. It doesn't make a difference. Can you see how everything pales in significance and only Allah is significant now? And how a person becomes so great with people afterwards as well? That's why the Prophet ﷺ never bothered with people who had enmity with him. Waminha, and then we'll just do one more. Waminha al adabu ma'a ahli ilm. To have respect for the people of knowledge, khususan khadamatu sharia or mashaikh tariq, especially those people who are in this, who are serving the sharia. So your jurists and ulama and others, imams, or mashaikh tariq, and also the sheikhs of the path, fainahum warathatul anbiya, because they are obviously the inheritors of the prophets. They inheritors of because they're continuing the mission of the prophets. They're doing the da'wah of the, their teaching, they're leading the prayers and so on. That's why your imam, at the end of the day, there's a, some, some of us don't like our imams, but then we're praying behind them for the, for the last 10 years. And we've not liked them for the last 10 years. Can you believe it? I, I've ne I never got around that one. Because I've been an imam for many, many years. And I used to think, these guys who don't like me for whatever reason, they still have to pray behind me. What a bad relationship that is. Right? What a sad fact that you don't like your Imam. Is that your punishment or the Imam's punishment? The most significant act is prayer in the deen. Right? That's the most significant act. And if that most significant act you have to do behind somebody you have bad thoughts about, even when you start praying, man, this Imam is like that, but you got no choice. He's your local Imam. You'd have to drive 10 minutes away right, to go and pray behind somebody else. What a punishment that is. <coughs> That's really sad. And yet shaitan tries to create that problem because he wants to spoil our prayer. He wants to go beyond the honorable. We ask Allah for tawfiq. We see in this life, right, there's some people, they have this attitude, they become so academic that the truth must be told, they say. But do we really tell the truth about everything? Do we tell people about ourselves? About things that may be embarrassing? Isn't that the truth as well? When there's somebody who doesn't... If somebody's spouse doesn't look too good, right? Are you going to call them ugly all the time and say, that's the truth, I must say it? You're not going to do that. Because as the, there's a saying in Arabic which says, لَيْسَ كُلُّ حَقٍ يُقَالُ Not every truth must be proclaimed. Because there's a place for everything. There's a place and an instance for everything. So just because something is the truth. So you've had some 
Muslim authors of the past who even criticize prophets. They criticize the Prophet ﷺ, but they don't think they're criticizing. They think they're just telling the truth. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said that Bu'ithu ana wa wasaa kahatain. Myself and the Day of Judgment has been have been sent just like these two. Some ulama have said it means you know the distance between the tip of that finger and that finger, so very close, or it's talking about the small gap in between, that we're very close. So this particular author, he says, 1400 years haven't demonstrated this yet. What does he mean? What did the Prophet also mean by, you know, when the Prophets had those slip-ups, they made a mistake. You have to say it as it is. I mean, don't you have the concept of adab and respect and just saying things in a nicer way? and not saying certain things because they're not necessary to be said what are you going to get by saying this? why shine the spotlight on that? it's a negative kind of ideology isn't it? and a mu'min should not have that kind of negative ideology we have adab in the world it's not black and white human beings are very comprehensive, very sophisticated beings right? and it's not all black and white we have to do certain things to make things work because life is about making things work not about just stating facts it's not what life is we ask Allah for tawfiq we ask Allah to make us balanced individuals Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum rahmatika nastaghith Allahumma ya hannan ya mannan la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin jazallahu anna muhammadan ma huwa ahlu O oh Allah, we ask you for your forgiveness. O oh Allah, grant us forgiveness. Forgive us all of those sins that we have committed in whatever way, shape or form. O oh Allah, our life is full of sin. O oh Allah, we become full embodiments of sin and disobedience. O oh Allah, there are many things that we don't even recognize as sins anymore. O oh Allah, they have become part and parcel of our lives. O oh Allah, we ask you for understanding, discernment and consciousness. O oh Allah, make us of those who witness you everywhere. O oh Allah, make us of those who are focused on you everywhere. O oh Allah, in whatever we are doing, O oh Allah, we ask that you grant us your presence. O oh Allah, that you grant us the understanding. O oh Allah, we're asking you for a very high status, despite the fact that our offerings are very meager. O oh Allah, we ask that you accept us for the service of your deen. O oh Allah, grant us your love and the love of those whose love benefits us with your, in your court. O oh Allah, make our surroundings conducive for us. O oh Allah, make your obedience beloved to us. O oh Allah, make your disobedience hated in our heart. O oh Allah, grant us the blessing in what you have given us. O oh Allah, all that you have given us. We can not thank you enough. Do not make it a source of fitna for us. Don't, do not make it a source of distraction from, uh, for us from you. O oh Allah, allow us to truly, grat to, to, to truly be grateful and to be the shakkareen and the dhakkareen, to be of those who constantly and abundantly remember you. Do not make us of those who are heedless. Do not make us of those who you've given so much to but they don't remember you. O oh Allah, who become distracted by the very bounties you have given. O oh Allah, we ask you forgiveness from all of those sins we've committed with the very wealth that you have given us. O oh Allah, you gave us wealth, you gave us health. O oh Allah, you gave us influence, you gave us position. O oh Allah, you gave us so many bounties. And then we forgot you. And O oh Allah, we use those same things to disobey you. O oh Allah, whatever gifts you have given us and you have given us abundantly, O oh Allah, make those a source of blessing and closeness to you. O oh Allah, make the rest of our life better than the previous part of our life. O oh Allah, make us closer to you than we've ever been before. And O oh Allah, we ask that you grant us the kalima la ilaha illallah on our deathbed. O oh Allah, all of the, the various different challenges that are surrounding us and that seem to be increasing. O oh Allah, we ask you strength. We ask you for strength. And O oh Allah, we ask you for fortitude. We ask you for understanding and discernment. O oh Allah, allow us to rise to these challenges and deal with them. 
Oh Allah, help our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. Help humanity in general. Bring back humanity back to the human being. Oh Allah, whatever permissible needs we have, we ask you to fulfill them. And bless us in whatever you have given us. Whatever permissible projects that we have, oh Allah, we ask that you grant us success in them and remove any obstacles in our path. Oh Allah, bless our families and especially our children and progeny until the day of judgment. Oh Allah, make our homes a place of great contentment, satisfaction and tranquility. Oh Allah, remove the darknesses that our homes may have. Remove the absence of blessing. Oh Allah, bring back the blessing in our homes. Oh Allah, remove our physical and spiritual ailments. Oh Allah, grant us all shifa. O oh Allah, grant us all well-being. O oh Allah, there are us and our family members who may be going through various different therapies or operations or surgeries. O oh Allah, make that those successful. And O oh Allah, grant us all protection. O oh Allah, grant us all protection. O oh Allah, grant us beneficial knowledge. O oh Allah, grant us accepted deeds. O oh Allah, grant us eyes that do cry in front of you. O oh Allah, protect us from eyes that do not shed any tears in front of you, hearts which do not tremble, hearts which are not fearful. O oh Allah, we ask you for hearts that are constantly calling out to you, that are constantly looking for you. O oh Allah, we ask that you, you, you grant us your love in our hearts in a full way. O oh Allah, those who have helped us and assisted us in whatever we have done, in whatever good achievements we have, O oh Allah, bless them all. O oh Allah, bless all of those who are here, those who are listening, and do not allow us to turn away from this without being completely forgiven and blessed. O oh Allah, accept our du'as. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzah. Am'amma yasifoon. Wa salamun al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil.